Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak to Aarhus University. I am delighted for your attention and for the attention that you've put for my article on reading AI images. My name is Eric Salvaggio, and I'm going to spend the next hour, maybe a little bit more, talking through some of how that approach has emerged and also um, walking through how it can be applied. I look forward to speaking to you live and interacting in person. Uh, for now, however, I hope you enjoy the talk. Quite quickly, I'm gonna change to share some slides. So we're starting here. This is essentially a frame of pure Gaussian noise. And when we talk about generative AI, it's important to remember that this is central. This is what generative AI begins with. And in order to understand generative AI, it's important to understand how it works with this. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about my own work as an artist and how I came to this methodology. As an artist, I started working with artificial intelligence systems in 2018. This is a set of images that I created using a previous form of image generation software called a GAN or a Generative Adversarial Network. What I would do is photograph these pussy willows, as they're called, using a black and white camera, digital camera, photograph about 500 of them set up against a white wall. And I would take these 500 images and I would train the generative adversarial network to identify patterns. And we can get into how generative adversarial networks operate, but that's not really our concern. The key thing here is that in order to build a generative adversarial network that could create images like these, I had to take these images in the first place. I had to create 500 images that looked like this. They created a data set, and the GAN analyzed that data set for patterns. With black and white, it's very easy to tell how this might work. Is it white or is it black? Or is it some gradient in between? What comes next to a white pixel? What comes next to a black pixel? This breaks these images that I made down, and then these that you see here are regenerated from that data set. So from a collection of 500 images, I could make infinitely more images. But what it could create had to be present in the data set. All of the images looked more or less like these. I was a digital artist. I worked with digital collage and I began collecting images online from public domain data sets, Flickr's Creative Commons archives, these kinds of things. And I would download images and sort them into particular categories. I would find a red apple and I would put it into a folder for round. I would put it into a folder for red. I would put it into a folder for fruit. Plums would fall into the same sets of categories. And overall, over time, I ended up with an archive of multiple images, thousands of images, that were categorized in a variety of different ways. This is a logic that I hope you'll keep in mind when we start to talk about diffusion models. All of my folders were categorized according to different properties that might apply to them, based on my own labeling and my own logic. With GANs, I could combine these folders. Instead of creating just apples or just plums, I could combine photographs of dancers from the category of dancers and from the photograph category of flowers, for example. Here we see the result of a generative adversarial network trying to find common patterns between that multiple images of dancers and multiple images of flowers in a way that it rendered only what existed between those two categories. Something of a hybrid form between flowers and dancers. 
I became interested in GANs and categories as a result of this and decided that I wanted to create a Wikipedia category for AI generated images of faces. And I quickly found by trying to create a diverse representation of these images from GANs that I was struggling. There was a system called StyleGAN, and this was a system that was trained on thousands of photographs of faces in order to create more faces. And this is what it did. It could only create faces. You would generate, and faces is what would emerge, because it had only been trained on faces. And as I tried to make faces that were diverse, I realized that images of Black women were not coming through with the kind of clarity that I would see in faces of white men or white women. Here you see three examples of faces of Black women generated by a generative adversarial network using StyleGAN2, which is trained on the Flickr dataset, which is downloaded from Flickr portraits, creative copyrights, licensed portraits of people uploaded to Flickr, the website, the photo sharing website. To the right, you see a white woman represented more or less photorealistically. And yet with these others, you see distortions, changes in skin tone. Um, there's just not the photorealistic tendencies you would expect to see based on the kind of photorealistic images it could generate of white men, white women, and other races. And I began to ask myself why. And I came up with a hypothesis, which is that if these images were downloaded from portraits gathered from Flickr, then perhaps the portraits were not well represented. They were not diverse. And so I began the struggle to generate these images. And I found that no matter what, all of these images were resulting from the generation button. These are faces that I could get from this model and black women were missing by and large. Here's the second round. These are infinite scrolls. You can scroll more or less forever to find these women, to find people. Here's one of them that ended up in the data set. But by and large, you see an absence of Black women appearing in what is generated. And so when you compare this to the data set that drove, that drove this model, I quickly realized that I couldn't look at them all, but I sampled 4,000 images. Of the 4,000, 102 contained Black women, less than 3%. By comparison, the number of images of white women in a separate random sample was 1152, or about 28%. And that's when it occurred to me, the presence and absence of information in the data set was reflected in what the data set generated. Today, we use a different system. We use something called diffusion models, which is an evolution of generative adversarial networks. But the fundamental relationship between data and images remains the same. And I want to start with this statement which we'll use to navigate through this presentation. And the idea of this statement is, generative AI is a process of constraining noise toward the central tendencies of assembled data using bias to steer. We will hopefully unpack this through a series of examples over the next hour. And by the end, I hope this will become intuitive. Let's begin with this idea of constraining noise. I pointed to it at the beginning. All AI-generated images created with diffusion models such as Stable Diffusion, Dolly 2, Midjourney, etc., begin with this, an image of Gaussian noise. This image of Gaussian noise has to be constrained towards a shape which is what is defined by the prompt. And when that happens, it's a bit akin to a person looking up at the nighttime sky. 
If you imagine that the two of us are camping and I point up at the sky and I say, look, it's the Big Dipper. You look at this constellation of stars and I've told you the Big Dipper is up there and you might search for it. And you might search and search. And if you believe me, you might say, ah, yes, there's the Big Dipper. I found it. And you found it because I've told you it was there to find the pattern in the stars. And you have a sense of what the Big Dipper is shaped like and what it looks like. And so you could find that pattern in the stars. But anyone who knows anything about the nighttime sky knows that this particular picture of the nighttime sky doesn't contain the Big Dipper. We found it because I told you the pattern was there. The same thing happens with a generative AI system. It will draw an image out of noise based on a pattern that it learns. But how does it learn that? Basically, it learns it through what's called a text and image pair. That is, images are found online. About 5 billion of these images form the basis of DALI and stable diffusion a data set called Leon 5B. The 5B means 5 billion. That's 5 billion images with captions, and these are paired so that when it encounters a picture of a flower like this one, the system also sees a caption that says flower. And what it then does is attempt to deconstruct this image by removing information from it, which is also understood as contributing noise. The removal of information is the addition of noise. Over time, this noise is introduced and it walks it back. So starts with a pure image, adds noise, learns how to go back to that pure image from that image of noise, and it cleans up the noise. It learns how to structure that noise back to the source image. And then it applies more noise. And then it walks that back to the last image and that back to the original. And then it moves forward and it adds more noise and more and more. And soon the image starts to lose details. As you watch us walk through this, you'll notice stems are missing from the flowers, but the leaves, the petals, they're still present. This cluster of pixels and color information is being divided last. It's losing signal last through the process of Gaussian noise distribution. Gaussian noise distribution follows a pattern and it tends to cluster around these dense concentrations of pixels. As we keep going, these loose outlines haunt this noise. And remember, it's constantly able to reverse this all the way back to that source. And so eventually, the signal is essentially lost. The image is pure noise. But the model has memorized this word flower, and it knows how to move this noise back to an image of a flower. And what it has done it, is, is, it has added this pathway, like a trail of breadcrumbs, to a collective concept, a collective mapping that overlaps. We could call it a concept if we're careful not to attribute that to some mental process. It's a mathematic formula that represents what we would call a concept of all of the flowers that it encounters. So there's 5 billion text and image pairs, and in that 5 billion text and image pairs, there are probably thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of flowers with the word flower in the caption. And all of these flowers go through this process, and they find a way back to constrain this noise toward the image of a flower. However, when we type the word flower into our prompt, when we ask the system to create an image, it doesn't create one flower. It creates from the abstraction of all of these flowers being broken down into noise. And slowly it starts to look at this noise 
and find patterns. And it adds noise and it makes more fine this digital noise until it starts to see some sort of cluster or clump that it can link to the idea of a flower that I've given it in the prompt. And slowly you'll see that from this random noise, it starts to identify things that maybe look like those flower petals. And because it can identify that and is told that there are flower petals in this image, it begins to refine those even further in a kind of feedback loop that concentrates on the images in this noise that look like flowers, and then begins to sketch those flowers based on its memory of previous flowers in the data set. And soon we start to see an entirely new image of flowers emerge. Now, this image contains a lot of information. It's not just flowers. It's also a picture of a nighttime sky that's been formed from all of its encounters with pictures that are labeled nighttime sky. It's the noise of flowers, the noise of certain flash bulbs, which we see here, uh, noise of certain nighttime photography. In other words, it's a collection of various forms of noise that have been constrained based on our prompts. Sometimes these reproduce the training data directly, but it's very unlikely. Diffusion recreates training data in rare occurrences where there are very few varieties of images in the data set that correspond with the prompt. So here is someone named Anne Graham Watts, an author who has one photo that's been distributed and is in the data set. There are not many other pictures of Anne Graham Watts. And so when it tries to recreate something from noise, it has a very limited view of what it can recreate. And so it will recreate from the training data. This is possible. But by and large, what we're looking at are abstractions built on top of random noise. The model samples from all of us contributing to the online conversation through our pictures, through our labels, through our memes. We put an image online and we describe it. And that description becomes part of the concept that's linked to that image and the way that that image breaks down. And it creates one massive data set, as opposed to generative adversarial networks, where I had to sort all of my pictures into different folders. The fusion is one giant folder. And all of that labeling information comes from us. And it comes from the ways that humans have described the images that it finds online. All of us contribute to this one data set, which is then constrained, sampled from, and handed off to the system's user. So it is a many to one, and then one to one model of communication. But just as photography was defined by the presence of light exposed to film, I argue that this generation of synthetic images is defined by the presence of structures and categories, ontologies, and I like to call them ontolographs, written by ontologies, written by the sense we make of the pictures we upload. That's what I mean by generative AI is a process of constraining noise. We are carving that noise into an image. We're constraining that noise. But what are we constraining it toward? I argue here that we are constraining it toward the central tendencies of assembled data. So let's look at this. Here, we have an image from the paper you read, and we also have an image of the Broad Street Pump, Jon Snow's map of the cholera epidemic which struck London in the 19th century. Jon Snow had access to all kinds of data, to the left, you see two sets of tables, very abstract mathematical representations of deaths from cholera. But no one knew what to make sense, how to make sense of this data. And so it wasn't until Jon Snow mapped this data to an actual map. Here, the Broad Street map of London, where each black rectangle represents a death. 
And I'm sorry that this is a bit macabre, but by mapping these deaths, Jon Snow was able to identify where the central tendencies of this data were found, which is they surrounded the Broad Street pump. And at the time, people thought that cholera spread through the air, through scents. It wasn't until this water pump was broken by Jon Snow, as the anecdote goes, that people started surviving, not catching cholera in this neighborhood. And that proved that this pump was reflecting a central tendency of the data represented in these tables. But by visualizing it, we were able to see it graphically as a visual representation, as an infographic. And we were able to take action accordingly. Likewise, when we are looking at an image generated by a diffusion model, we are mapping data. We are mapping the pixel information of an image, such as this, from the Wikipedia Flowers article, to a label, the fruit of a peach with the seed or stone inside. This is your text. And this text is broken down, and this image is categories, categorized according to the text. Fruit, peach, seed, stone. So these images get associated with the clusters in those categories. Now, over time, we create a kind of stereotype of flowers or peaches. And the same is true of pictures of people. To the left here, we see some of the samples of the training data that is associated with the phrase typical America, which I'm using as an American um, so that you can compare me to the image that is generated by stable diffusion. You also don't see me in the training data. To the left, you see a lot of flags, which come across on the right in the image that is generated by stable diffusion. Because American is associated with this prompt, typical American. And American overlaps with many categories, including the American flag. It also overlaps with people. If you look closely at the data set, one of the things that also comes up is the American Independence Day, where people will oftentimes wear face paints. And so many pictures that were generated using this prompt, typical American, include red, white, and blue face paint. But there's something else I think is very curious. Um, a lot of stereotypes in this image, including this cowboy hat, leather jackets, red, white, and blue tie, uh, the man is a little bit on the hefty side, as I like to say, uh, which corresponds to many stereotypes of Americans. But one of the things I want to point out in the training data, there are four incidences of this man holding a Big Gulp, which is a syrupy, sugary uh, beverage served at convenience stores here in uh, my home country, the Big Gulp. And what do you see in this man's hand? You see a very large red beverage. And this large beverage appears over and over again in images generated for this idea of typical America. And part of this is because this meme of this American holding this gigantic cup, which is fictionalized, just in case there's any question. Uh, the Big Gulp is big, but it's not that big. Um, this is a fictionalized meme. And memes appear over and over and over again in the training data. And every time this system encounters that image, it's registered as a new point of information, which means if there are a hundred of these images in the data set and one image of me, it's going to represent that big gulp more often than it's going to represent me. I've done similar experiments. Here is an experiment for a typical British person. And what do we see? We see four elderly white men. We also see hats that indicate British because of that overlap with British flag, signposts of British identity. But let's keep going, because certainly there has to be more than four elderly British white men. Here's four more. Well, now we have a woman. Uh, this woman is eating a bug or something. It's a bit strange, right? 
So underrepresented and actually not very well represented, right? This image is not photorealistic. But we have three other white elderly men. Let's try it again. Ah, I think we can detect a pattern. Elderly white men appearing when I ask for typical British person. And here we are again. So why would this be? If we understand that a typical British person is not a typical white person, is not a typical male person, is not a typical elderly person, right? The UK is a broad, diverse country. It has diverse genders, diverse uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds, diverse ages. And yet, it's clear to me that something in the data set associated with typical British person is associated with an elderly white man. This type of thing has been tested. A recent article um, by Rest of World magazine has attributed, uh, has basically taken this methodology and proven its case, generating 3,000 images based on very similar prompts to the one that I proposed. Here they saw Indian person is almost always an old man with a beard. They would try for a Mexican person and they would find that it would typically be a man in a sombrero. So these types of images do appear in the training data and they are informed by the captions that are used by people describing certain images. And they use those texts to generate a stereotype. And the stereotype can be an apple, the stereotype could be a butterfly or a flower, or it could be a stereotype of a person. And so I hope this makes clear that what we are looking at is the central tendencies of assembled data. When you cluster all of this information together and you prompt for something in that data set, it will find what is in the most common overlap of the text you've written and the images that are described by that text, the central tendencies of the data. And we use bias to steer. In the data set to the left, we see an example of training data used for the term girl. Images of girl are to the left side, Images of black girl are to the right. Let's look at girl first, because this is a sampling, but I can tell you that many, many pages of the training data are these Victorian era portraits of very young girls, the majority of whom are white. In the training data, girls means white girls. When we ask for black girls, we see something very different. And Sophia Noble has pointed this out with search engine results for years on Google. The front page, if you search for black girls, would give you links to pornography. Um, only after Sophia Noble, Dr. Sophia Noble published her work, did Google eventually intervene and modify the way it processes that, handle, that data in order to make it so that you could actually find out information about black children when you were looking for black girls. Here, however, in Leon 5B, the training data that is used for these diffusion models, we see images of women with their breasts exposed. We see, for the most part, young women, not girls, a lot of nudity. We also see racist memes. And importantly, this black, space that you see in the image is explicit hardcore pornography, which I've censored for your sake, but it is images of hardcore pornography taken from explicit websites. And so this is the data that informs the model's conception of black girls. When you prompt for black girls, this is the data it draws from. Almost none of these are girls. They are not children. They are adults, and in some cases, they're extremely adult, and the images are extremely pornographic and racist. And this is what I mean. We are using bias 
to steer these systems. We use bias in what we write as our prompts in order to get certain images. And we also create these biases in the data set through this sort of collective project of labeling images online and relying on the images as they are labeled online without any mediation. Here is another example. If we look at photographs of criminals, we see the images to the left. If we look for photographs of professor, we see images on the right. The commonalities that we see here are a result of what is in the training data. It will only manifest what is in the training data. And so for me, as an artist, one of the things I've been interested in is pushing beyond the central tendencies the idea that a person looks a certain way, has a certain skin color or a certain shaped body, has a certain number of limbs. These are the types of things I like to test in the systems. And I do this by pushing the boundaries of the systems, by asking them to generate images of Gaussian noise. We're looking at an image of Gaussian noise, which is what the system starts from. And I will prompt it to create images of Gaussian noise, creating a kind of feedback loop that confuses the system and doesn't allow it to render things appropriately. But by not rendering things appropriately, it could create all kinds of abstractions that don't make any sense. And paired with certain kinds of prompts, these abstract images start to take on new forms and create different kinds of shapes so here I create images of hands, which the system traditionally cannot represent well, and we'll cycle through them as a way of pushing the boundaries on what a normal, quote unquote, normal body looks like to the system, as a way of challenging this kind of averaging of bodies that says the middle ground is what is expected, what is expected is normal. I try to challenge this. And I'd like to talk to you a bit about the paper and the process of reading the AI image as an infographic. Following the principle that I've just described, this methodology is meant to say, how do we look at an image? Well, we can look at an AI generated image as representing a small portion of a larger data set of images. That is the 5 billion images that are used in training data. And that data set represents a small portion of our experienced world. It's very important that we acknowledge that the images and the labels are coming from the internet. The internet has a particular set of biases. Memes are overrun with communities that are not so kind, uh, oftentimes uh, reflecting some of the worst impulses of human nature. And as a result, the same thing can be said of the images that are generated when we sample from this culture, from this visual culture. But that is what we are doing. We are not creating representations of the world in the sense that the model does not understand what things look like. The model understands images on the internet and how they've been labeled. So this is an image that I generated of two people kissing. I asked it for pictures of humans kissing. And I got this, and I found it to be incredibly awkward. Um, delightfully awkward, I'll say. As an artist, I'm just very thrilled that I got an image as strange as the ones I received. But I was also curious as to why. And I was hearkening back to my questions around why diversity in the GAN data set was so hard to find. And I concluded that probably we can infer that if images are represented weirdly, then something's missing in the data set. And if there are biases in what we see, then that reflects the data set. And so I wanted to see how we might attribute or link the images that we produce to the images in the training data. So these are the steps that you've read about how to read an AI image. And I wanna go through them one by one. The first step is to produce an image until you find one that interests you. In this case, this image I found fascinating. So this is what started my journey. The next step 
is pretty simple. Describe the image simply, making note of interesting and uninteresting features. This takes a little bit of getting used to. What exactly is an uninteresting feature? Uh, Barts has said that what's noted is notable, um, but I would say also what's taken for granted is also notable. And so by looking at this image, we can say, what is interesting about it? Well, the kiss, the kiss doesn't touch, right? The, this doesn't look like the way people kiss. There's a lack of eye contact. There's a distant gaze in this image, right? And so when we look at this, there's something uncanny about it. And so we can start with that. But there's a couple of other things that we might say that are potentially uninteresting, depending on your point of view. And this is highly subjective, but based on this image, we can make a note of something, which is, this is a heterosexual couple. And that may be interesting or uninteresting, depending on what comes next, which is to create a new set of samples drawing from the same prompt. When we do that, and we ask for pictures of people kissing, photographs of humans kissing, we get a variety of images. I've selected nine um, to show here, but ultimately for this, I created more than this. I created about 36. Um, for other experiments, you can create far more. Um, we looked at the example uh, that rest of the world did, and they had done thousands of images using the same prompts in order to see what those central tendencies were. But here, we created a new set of samples drawing from the same prompts and data set, right? We're using the same tool to create these images. And now we can start looking at the images we've created and we can go to step four, conduct a content analysis of these sample images and identify strengths and weaknesses. Now there's some confusion about what strengths and weaknesses might mean. So I wanna clarify this. Strengths are aspects of the image that are most realistic or appear most often within a series of the sampled images. That suggests a strong presence in the data set. Weaknesses are aspects of the image that appear uncanny or appear as outliers within a series of sampled images. It suggests a weak or peripheral pr presence in the data set. So when we look for strengths, one of the things we might notice is all of these couples are heterosexual. There are no men kissing men. There are no women kissing women. When we ask for humans kissing, we get heterosexual couples kissing. Um, in the sense that there are any other diversity of genders, they are not present here. We also tend to see a lot of similar skin tones in these images. Not all, there is some diversity, um, but enough to say it's probably a strong symbol, strong signal that racially homogenous couples are missing and gender diverse couples are missing. Those would be weak signals. What is strong is the opposite. Um, heterosexual couples are strong. Um, homogenous racializations, um, which is always complex when talking about images of people who don't exist. Nonetheless, um, representations of diversity are also absent. So strengths, aspects of the image that are realistic or appear often. Weaknesses, aspects of the image that appear uncanny or as outliers. Realistic kisses, right? Let's look closely, look at these lips. Not realistic, right? And so we might say, is there a absence of data in the underlying data set about people kissing, convincing photographs of people kissing? And we might argue, yes. Our next step is to connect these patterns to corresponding strengths and weaknesses in that underlying data set. So we've already started jumping ahead to this, right? We've started asking, could there be missing images of women kissing women in the data set or men kissing men? Could that be absent from the training data? Is it possible that there just simply aren't um, diverse images of people kissing in the training data? These are valid questions. And when we talk about strengths and weaknesses in the training data, sometimes we have access to that training data. Leon 5B is open, we can look at it. 
Um, other models such as Dolly, now Dolly 3, don't have publicly accessible data sets. But we can infer, we can make inferences about that data by looking at things like Lion 5B, which is 5 billion images. And we can reason and infer that Dolly OpenAI is not leaving 5 billion images on the table. They're going to take that data set. And so that data set probably informs some of what they're doing. We can also look at Google images and see what does a online representational sample look like? Google images is not connected to the training data. We don't know that the things that we see in Google Images are in the training data, but it gives us a representative a representative control group to look at as a way that images are labeled and present what's present online. And we can make inferences. You do not want to make conclusions based on Google image search, just to be clear, but you can make inferences. And when we look at those things, we can ask ourselves a certain set of questions emerging from the information we found in our image sample. Images that are within the median range of a stereotype are a result of sharing significant commonalities and denoising pathways, in other ways, in other words, the way that that static gets constrained. That's a median range, right? That's the central tendencies of the training data suggest homogenous couples right, uh, in terms of racialization, and it suggests that same-sex couples are weak, weakly represented in the training data. This may or may not be true, but it starts us on the direction of asking questions. Now, a key piece of this is system-level interventions. One of the things I found is that if I asked Dolly 2, this is done with Dolly 2, if I asked it for images, a photograph of two women kissing, I would get a content restriction. I would get a warning that I was not allowed to pr produce those images. That essentially I was asking for something too risque or racy. Uh, OpenAI uses the language of racy in its um, system reports. So it doesn't want to create racy images. And as a result of not wanting to create racy images, it will not create pictures of women kissing women. But it will create pictures of men kissing men. And we can think about this as a system level intervention. OpenAI has made the decision not to allow us to create this prompt. But if we add context, it will allow us to do it. And the reason for that is OpenAI is aware that women kissing women will tap into parts of the data set and training data that are largely scraped, that include pornographic content, and it leads to an increased likelihood of producing pornographic content. If you look at Leon 5B and the training data, women kissing women is actually overrepresented in the data set, but it is overrepresented in pornographic images which OpenAI had to remove from the training data before training its model in order to avoid degenerating pornographic images. This is a system level intervention in the data. It's also a system level intervention in that it blocks the prompt anyway. So these images are not going to be produced because that data has been removed from the training data, but it also doesn't let you ask for it anyway. There are other types of system level interventions that intervene. Stable Diffusion will allow uh, you to ask any prompt you want, but it will use a machine vision tool as these images are being generated. And if it identifies something that is gory or violent or sexualized, it will blur it. It will blur out the image and you can't actually look at the image it produces. That is a model of content moderation, a system level intervention. But if you add enough context, it stops leaning into the pornographic territory. And so you can ask it, contemplate the stars, photograph of two women kissing, and you will get images of two women kissing uh, with this sort of brilliant science fiction backdrop. System level interventions are increasingly common. I've recently written an article on, uh, for Tech Policy Press about shadow prompting. Dolly 3 is now linked to GPT-4. Your prompts go to GPT-4, and GPT-4 actually changes what you request. 
It adds more detail to your prompts in order to generate more realistic images. But it can also change uh, prompts and words that you use into less offensive or problematic synonyms. In other words, it replaces your prompts with euphemisms as a way of steering the system away from content that might be objectionable. Shadow prompting is acknowledged. Uh, OpenAI has acknowledged that what you prompt is only a suggestion to the image model. Your words are altered before they reach the image model, Dolly 3, with opaque editorial decisions employed to filter out problematic requests and obscure the model's inherent biases. Examples of this might be adding the word black to doctor in order to generate images of black doctors. As we saw with the prompt professor, it only generated images of white men. Now, if you ask for professor, Dolly 3 may get a prompt that you did not write from GPT-4, and it may add woman or black or other diversifying markers to modify that request for a professor. And there are certain sets of rules that it will follow to apply to those images, which I've outlined in this article if you're interested. And with all that out of the way, we can go back in and we can re-examine that original image and understand the broader context that it represents. That an image does not stand alone. There is no such thing as an AI image. There's only a sample of the conceptual space that is built inside of these models. And that is a mixture of randomness from that noise that we have constrained using our words towards the biases of the model itself, that it is gathered up from the internet, from our captions, and this is the system. Diffusion images are created by constraining noise toward the central tendencies of a data set. That data set has been structured into loose associations through the arbitrary consensus of image labeling. The process of constraining noise into an image is shaped first by the arbitrary spread of noise across that image file, that Gaussian noise, that pure static, and then a feedback loop of image recognition and noise reduction carves the image from that noise. This process is steered by prompts toward the central tendencies the system can find within that noise related to image structures associated with those words in the prompts we use. Which brings us back to our initial statement. We read these images as constraining noise toward the central tendencies of assembled data using bias to steer. Generative AI is a process of constraining noise toward the central tendencies of assembled data using bias to steer. Really quickly, I can say we can apply this to all kinds of different images. Um, here is an image that I've been working on understanding simply through the way that images in the archive inform and shape the images that we prompt. This is an image that results from being asked to create a photograph of a seance of the digital archive. Um, and there are key pieces in this document that I find fascinating and troubling alike. The first is this collection of photographs. If we look here, we can look at the Leon 5B data set and we can ask it for archives. And we can see how this conception of archives is formed. And we see that in the training data, there are lots of these types of piles of photographs. And when we look closer, we find that these piles of photographs are absolutely chaotic um, representation of images that bear little resemblance to the way a human would think about categorizing or associating them. All that's required for this data set, to, for this model to understand what an image is, is for the word archive to be in the caption. And so we have in this image traces, not direct, but from the trading data from archives, we can find training data that links to boxes of um, Nazi soldiers vacationing with their families, including um, images 
of Holocaust victims from a memorial wall, um, to images of death and destruction from World War I, to images of Archie comics. And in this image, we can actually trace these piles of photographs, those archives. We trace the lighting to episodes of Riverdale, the teen comedy that appears on the WB here in the United States based on the Archie comics. And it is this strange juxtaposition of cultural context that I think is ultimately stripping away the data that these images and models are trained on from any kind of cultural consensus or meaning. And ultimately we lose control over the memory associated with these things when they become reduced to noise and training data. Even if this training data, even if this the original images are preserved, that there remains a Holocaust wall where victims can be memorialized, they're still being reduced into digital noise and clustered together with the perpetrators of that crime. And I think that this is a really important thing to start asking questions about. And artists are asking questions about the way that this data is being gathered, stripped of context, stripped of meaning, stripped of citation, and reassembled into various forms. We call it a remix, but ultimately I think diffusion is the word. It's a breaking down, a severance from history and a reassemble, a reassembly of something absolutely devoid of history. And I think that's an interesting and important way to remember what these images are, that the contexts are being steered through a kind of absence of any type of interconnectedness to actual cultural meaning. And with that, I think it's best to stop and ask you to record your questions and think about things that you'd like to discuss with me in our live session. And um, I just really wanna say, if you're interested in testing this and you have access to an AI system, do feel free to create an image of interest using that AI system, document your prompt, and then search for the keywords in your prompt using either Google Images or haveibeentrained.com, which will create uh, explicit content, just so you're warned. If you don't want to see um, gore or pornography, avoid Have I Been Trained. Instead, use Google Images. It will not give you a direct representation of the training data, but you will be able to make inferences. And then ask yourself, what might the images in these searches tell you about the logic of the image that you've created and the prompt you've used to get it? Um, and so with that, I'm going to skip ahead and give you my information in case you want to find me. You can find me at eric.salvaggio at gmail.com. Feel free to email me. Please put Arhus in the subject line and I will get back to you uh, and I'll know where you're from. And you can also find me on Mastodon and Instagram at Cybernetic Forest if you'd like to follow me there. Um, and this QR code will take you to a newsletter that I write more or less weekly where things like this paper originally occurred and appeared. Uh, and so if you want to follow me there, you're welcome to. But I will see you in person uh, and I look forward to your questions and the results of any experimentation you've done. No pressure, um, but I'd love to see and hear from you uh, on that day. So thank you so much for your time and attention and thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to chatting with you. Thanks again.